I've always loved Cartoon Network. When I was growing up, it was my favorite channel to watch. Even today, there are some good shows like Adventure Time and Regular Show. One of the latest shows on Cartoon Network, The Amazing World of Gumball, is a cute and mildly entertaining show. Not really my cup of tea, it's a little immature, but my brother seems to like it a lot. One day I was watching Adult Swim and I realized that I had been up so late that I hadn't kept track of time. It was already 4am. I didn't recall ever watching as this late. A little bumper showed up at the bottom of the screen during a commercial break. It said that a special episode of Amazing World of Gumball was about to come on. I was a little confused about an episode of a very popular or new show coming on this early, but I was bored and decided I could watch it, thinking it might come on later in the day so I could spoil it for my brother. Sort of mean, I know. The flashy and energetic intro theme played, although it played a little differently than I recall, the music was a little different and the show's logo wasn't animated. Its colors were done rather sloppy as well, almost like something a little kid drew on a doodle board or a glow board. I ignored it, assuming it was done just for this quote-unquote special episode. The title of the episode was The Grieving. Sort of a sad title, but I didn't really pay too much attention. It began with Gumball, the show's 12-year-old protagonist, standing alone facing the corner of his dimly lit classroom. He looked absolutely miserable, a far cry from the cheerful demeanor he usually had. There was no one else in the room, not even his best friend and adopted brother Darwin, the goldfish. And the windows in the room clearly showed the night sky outside. I was getting really confused. Why would he be at a school at night? And why was he standing in the corner all alone? After about what seemed like a minute of Gumball standing somberly in the corner, the scene suddenly changed. We were in Gumball's house once again, and the scene is silent and a little disquieting. Richard, Gumball's enormous rabbit father, walks in from the kitchen. He looked even more miserable than Gumball had in the previous scene. Richard wasn't wearing his usual attire. He's dressed in a fancy black suit, a little uncharacteristic of him. As he's usually a slob, he sighs and slumps down into the sofa and starts sobbing intensely, sounding like someone who had just lost something important. I was starting to get a little creeped out. Where was the silly, fun cartoon that I usually look forward to watching with my younger brother? This is something completely different. I was beginning to think that it might have something to do with the creators as an experiment or something. A test of the animation or sound, perhaps. Though it couldn't have been. Aside from the opening theme, which is still different from the final shows, the episode had been much quieter than it usually was. Only subtle sounds and very little music. And the animation was not anything to write home about either. It was done a bit like an amateur flash on Newgrounds. The character designs were somewhat sloppy and rushed looking, and the real life backgrounds used for the show looked different. As confused as somewhat frightened as I was. For some reason, I kept watching it. Poor Richard was still sobbing on the sofa as the front door opened suddenly, making me jump from such a loud noise. And Gumball's mother, Nicole, a blue cat like him, stepped in. Like Richard, she wasn't wearing her usual outfit. For some reason, she was in a black dress wearing a pretty black hat to match. Nicole sat down on the couch to comfort her husband, although she was looking a bit sad herself. By this point, Richard's crying had begun to get more and more miserable sounding. This wasn't the normal cartoon. This was realistic and almost depressing. I almost felt like sobbing myself. Finally, what after seemed like hours, the scene at their home ended as it shifted back to the school. We weren't in Gumball's classroom this time. We were in Principal Brown's office. Nicole and Richard were there, in their usual clothes, looking more normal and happy, but still slightly worried. Principal Brown, however, looked extremely sad. He quietly and somberly informed that their children were not present after lunch earlier that day. They hadn't been seen at all by the rest of the kids. 
Nicole is instantly furious at him. She begins spouting various insults and calls at him that I don't think they would have made. I was laughing at this, because it seems sort of funny for Nicole to flip out in a manner and start swearing like a sailor in a G-rated cartoon. But my outlook soon changed when Principal told her something else after she finally quieted down. His eyes began to tear up as he informed them that they eventually were found. But they had not been found alive. He then went into graphic, nearly nauseating detail describing how their bodies were found. Their parents were sitting there in utter shock. I could hardly believe what was happening. How could such a cheery and fun kids show be taking such a dark, twisted turn? I was considering turning the television off, but I was too scared to be left in the dark now. Nearly frozen by fear and disturbed intensely at the terrible things that he was saying. Another flashback. The scene was earlier that day, and the animation in the scene have got even worse than earlier. I don't remember it very clearly, but I think it began as a recollection by saying the school had been called by the police department, believing that the kids simply ran off and decided to skip school. They said it was really uncharacteristic for both Darwin and Anise to go skipping school like delinquents. Darwin was a little naive and a bit ditzy, and Anise was even less likely to run away. She was a straight-A student, despite of being only four, which also troubled the police, seeing as a defenseless four-year-old little girl was missing, as well as an older boy. The school had been thoroughly checked, so the police started a search in a heavily wooded area outside the school. It took a little time for the police to discover the horrifying fate of Anise. In a small clearing, Outside the school, her head was found in a small box. You would likely expect something like that to be shown in the show's cutesy art style, but nothing like that at all. Realistic blood covered the box inside and out, and her head was done in the normal style. But it was drenched in blood and some of the other fluids. Not all of them hers, apparently. There was a note on the box, seemingly written under blood. It was never stated during the episode what exactly was written in that note, but it apparently led to the rest of the remains of Darwin's heavily mutilated corpse. What I remember most about this scene was how out of place it seemed. All the blood and gore from Darwin and Anissa's slaughtered and dismembered remains was done in a very realistic and disturbing way. It looked like the scene had been taken from a crime scene photograph, and done by a professional, not by something of a cartoon. The way this scene was animated was different from most of the show as well. You may know that the characters from this scene are done in a vastly differing animation styles, from flash animation to CGI, and I think there's even a character done by putting their chin upside down to make a face. This particular scene wasn't anything I'd ever seen in the show before. Every little detail on Darwin's face was clearly illustrated. He looked like a zombie. His face was very pale and his eyes had been gouged out by someone. Anissa's fared no better, or what was left of her anyway. She was naked and her stomach had been slit open. Her intestines were strewn in the trees and the bushes in the woods. Done once again in a very morbid and realistic style. I was feeling very ill. By the time this incredibly disturbing flashback had come to an end, so I quickly ran to the bathroom to vomit. I was feeling better after upchucking, so I'd realized I had good timing when I ran to the bathroom for a commercial. It was then I noticed the show had been running twice as long. It usually ran for 11 minutes, but this episode was running about 30. By then, I was wondering if there was any information on this The Grieving on IMDb or something. So while I was on commercials, I looked up some of the information about this episode on Google. Nothing came up. No information remotely similar to the plot or the name of the episode existed anywhere. Now incredibly scared and wondering if anybody else was watching, I dialed my brother Larry and asked him to turn to Cartoon Network to see if he was seeing the same shit I was. He was pretty mad that I woke him up at this hour, but he's a nice guy and he told me he would see for me. I thanked him and stayed on the line. The scene 
thankfully panned away from the horrific sight of the children mutilated, and was back to the principal's office. I asked Larry if he saw the same cartoon of animals talking or crying, since that's what they were doing on my TV. To my surprise, he said that he saw nothing like that. Instead, it was a rerun of old Looney Tunes short. In utter shock, I dropped my phone and ran over to the TV to turn it off. And as hard as I pressed the buttons, it would not shut off at all. I tried every single damn button, and it didn't do a thing. I tried unplugging the whole thing as well, but nothing worked. The TV stayed on no matter what. Larry had hung up, assuming that I was playing some joke or something. I guess I was alone once again. My door was locked from the outside somehow. The door to my bathroom was locked as well. It seemed that I had no choice but to call the police since my other family members were gone at night. It was the reason I could stay up so late to watch Adult Swim in the first place. When I hurriedly dialed the number, I accidentally dropped my cell phone into my cup of Pepsi. I was very scared. I had no choice but to finish the episode. I turned on all the lights in my room and got under the covers, hiding like my little brother does when I make him watch scary movies with me. I had apparently missed a little bit, but Gumball's parents were still talking to the Principal Brown. So not that much. Nicole was asking him if Gumball was alright. Apparently since she hadn't remembered him when Principal Brown told her what happened to Darwin and Anise, he looked slightly confused and shocked for a moment, and explained to her that he thought Gumball was out sick today. He'd spent the whole day home by himself with a stomach bug. Nicole screamed and walked while Richard quietly told him, in a very out-of-character voice. They thought Gumball had gone on the bus this morning, but it didn't seem that way. The police were called once again to search the building in the small forest outside. They had found him in Miss Simon's room, hanging by a noose with a blood-covered knife behind him and blood covering his clothing. The episode ended with a shot of Gumball's dead body hanging there in the corner fading back and the credits rolled silently. Not like the usual way Cartoon Network is annoying, the airs promos and squishes them to the half bottom of the screen. These credits rolled usually slow and weren't that fun to watch either. A little creepy, just plain white text scrolling along a black background. Only recognized Ben Bookwillet's name. He's the creator of the show. The rest of the people I've never even heard of. The copyright notice end said, Copyright Cartoon Network Studios 2001. Which was incredibly odd, seeing that the show was new for 2011. After all that was over, the screen went to static for a split second, during which some incredibly creepy and shocking video clips were shown between static intervals. I can still remember them very clearly. The first was a picture of a person in a plague doctor outfit. Those always scare me for some reason. And the way the person in the suit was filmed was just as bad. A red light, something that freaks me out incredibly was shown over the clip. The next was what seemed like a video playing very quickly, over and over, a kitten's face being squished by a woman's high heels. Which was strange because a so-called quote-unquote friend of mine sent me a picture yesterday of a cat being stepped on and killed, similar to the kitten in the video. The last one was the one that disturbed me the most and made me want to both cry and vomit my guts out. It was my little brother, or at least a small child who looked very similar to him, being shot in the face by a person who looked like my father, who could clearly see the child's brains and blood splatter on the wall. I began to sob uncontrollably after that traumatizing clip, so much so that I passed out. When I woke up, my door was unlocked and the television was turned off. I went to call the police on my home phone in my kitchen and report what happened on my TV and the doors had been locked. When they arrived, they could find nothing like what I remembered from early this morning. My internet history had never been cleared. They were angry at me and just assumed I had a bad nightmare. 
when I was sure I had it. Thankfully, one of the officers felt bad for me and took me out to a small dinner so I could recollect my thoughts. At the dinner, I remembered that my family was out visiting my aunt, and they were supposed to be back at noon or so. It was already 11, so the officer and I drove back to find a whole squad of police cars and even some government agents at my house. They explained to me that my little brother was missing and my mother and father were the major suspects. I was freaking out and trying to tell them about the disturbing clip of the boy who looked like my brother being shot in the head, but they wouldn't listen. I stayed with my older brother, Larry, who couldn't believe me either, still insisting that what I saw was a Looney Tunes cartoon and nothing creepy or weird. The cops eventually told me that they would contact Turner Broadcasting and tell them about the incident. A representative at Turner Broadcasting came to my cousin's house to talk to me private about what I had seen and experienced that night. He was very kind, but it all seemed like sort of upfront. After I could tell him what I remembered, he agreed to play back the day's programming from the incident with me. The disturbing Gumbel episode had occurred. To my shock, all that was airing was some old Looney Tunes. Nothing more, nothing less. I hysterically sobbed and moaned that what I experienced had been completely real, but nobody listened. Eventually, I discovered that Ben Boquille had a Twitter account, so I sent a message to him about the episode, and this is the reply I got. One thing, how in the heck did you find that? I never, ever, ever thought about that old shame again. But the amazing world of Gumball goes back farther than you know. I used to have a really boring job as a teen, and I sketched drawings of the Water Sons and Friends. The episode you saw was never supposed to be seen by anyone but me and a few friends of mine. It was a very, very awful thing to do, but we made the episode as a joke. A guy from my old job who hated and lost a child to a crazed killer who was apparently still out there somewhere. Anyway, we made it so we can make fun of how we came to work. Crying like a fool, which is why you saw Mr. and Mrs. Watterson cry so much in that episode. I know, I'm deeply sorry for what I did, which is why I tried to bury that stupid thing years ago. Literally, I went out to my countryside with my mates and dug a hole and buried it. What I don't get, though, is how you describe the blood and guts and stuff. We didn't have any scene with Darwin and Anissa's bodies being found. All that happens was the episode and the parents were informed that the kids were found dead and they were crying like crazy. That was it. We didn't even draw anything in the episodes besides that. We're not that sick. Now, this is my theory. The lunatic who killed the man's child found the tape we buried, watched it, and heavily edited it. Then he hijacked the local TV station near your area. Somehow, and got the episode to air on your local Cartoon Network station. Now, why your brother couldn't see it, I have no idea. Why it seems you're the only one who saw it, I have no idea either. I'm sorry, I just don't know. Now for the explanation you've been waiting for. The clip's at the end. I don't know. I don't. I'm deeply sorry. From the bottom of my heart, but I don't know where those clips were aired. I just don't. I'm sorry, I really am. But me and my maids are just... It was just one of those scenes with Richard and Nicole crying. That's it. I'm so sorry. I'm deeply sorry. Best wishes. Ben Bonquile. And everyone involved with the grieving.